Welcome to the Essential Southern Podcast, where we explore the rich history, culture, and traditions of the American South. Welcome to the Essential Southern Podcast, sponsored by the Abbeville Institute. The Abbeville Institute is dedicated to exploring what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. Go to abbevilleinstitute.org, that's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, institute.org. You can make a donation, you can donate annually, uh, monthly, or a one-time gift, and your donations are tax-deductible to the full extent of the law. We do appreciate your support and your contributions. Well, let's talk about the topic, and that is a speech given by Stephen Dill Lee in 1896 in Richmond, Virginia. And it's a speech at the dedication of a monument to Jefferson Davis, a monument which is no longer there. It torn down in the last few years uh, during the protests that took place starting in 2020. Now, Stephen Dill Lee was one of the founders of the United Confederate Veterans. Uh, He was an important part of this post-bellum South and the remembrances that took place. Lee spoke all over the United States uh, to various groups, Grand Army of the Republic groups, Confederate veteran groups, uh, at memorial observations, again, all over the United States. He wasn't just someone who spoke to the South. And he was invited in 1896, July of 1896, to give a speech at the dedication of the cornerstone of a new monument to Jefferson Davis. Now, Davis had uh, only died a, a few years before this. And uh, he was certainly one of the most important figures of the wartime South. I mean, without question, he was a president of the Confederacy. And of course, Davis had been called all kinds of names, traitor, and, uh, most importantly. And so there was an effort made in the South here at this particular time period to erect monuments to Confederate soldiers, just as they were doing in the North, to Union soldiers, people were remembering the war. It's important to note that, again, Lee spoke all over the United States in the 1880s and 90s to veterans groups. People were thinking about the war 20 and 30 years on. And that is the key to understanding what's happening here. It's no different than memorial observations of, say, 9-11, 20 years on or to World War II observations that take place now 70 years later, 80 years later, at Normandy and other places. People are remembering the dead. They're remembering the people that had served, the men who had died, and, of course, the cause for which they fought. But what's often said about these dedication ceremonies and speeches and memorials is that these people were disingenuous. They weren't really telling the real story about why these monuments were there. That is a strange argument to make, that people would would take the time to write an entire speech that's a lie. (laughs) That people would actually go out of the way to speak for an hour or more about a lie. And that is essentially the accusation. If you want to know what these monuments were for, and that's why we're covering this on an Essential Southern podcast, we'll just read the dedication addresses. They don't need contextualization. They're already contextualized. There are engravings. There's, there's inscriptions on the monuments. Now, many of these monuments, of course, are gone, and that is a travesty to historical preservation. And if you read, as we go through parts of the speech, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but as you go through parts of it, you should feel a bit of sadness about this for what Davis, I'm sorry, Lee had to say about Davis, but also what Lee had to say about the future and what this monument would mean. It's now gone. And what Lee had hoped it would mean has also been erased from memory, from time. The monument is no longer there. For those that say, this is not really erasing history, you're erasing bad stuff. You're erasing memory. Without that memory, history is gone. And that's what these people hope to preserve. And he explains why Jefferson Davis was giving a monument in Virginia, a son of Mississippi, he explains why it happened. Of course, Lee is also from Mississippi. But he explains why this was important. And it's important to note that it wasn't just Confederate veterans here in 1896 in Richmond, Virginia. There were people from all over the United States who had come to witness this event because this was 
a grand celebration of not just Jefferson Davis, but also the South, and uh, a reconciliation, as Davis, as Lee will point out with Davis, as Lee says, this is a reconciliation. The past is buried. This is about the future, and it's about a future where we can celebrate people that fought for what they thought was right, right? For liberty. And this is what he says in, in the particular speech. So you can contest what he thinks about what Davis was fighting for, but the fact is that Davis is remembered at all is something that's essentially important. And for many Southerners, when we say the Essential Southern Podcast, what is true and valuable, you look at the cause of secession, this is what they thought of it. They're not lying about what they said about it. This is really what they thought about secession. This is what they thought about American government. This is what they thought about the powers of the central authority. They weren't, they weren't fibbing. They weren't making this stuff up. They said it. Okay, so I want to read a couple of parts of this. So again, this is July 2nd, 1896, Stephen Dill Lee. He says, let us glance backward. 31 years ago, on the soil of this very commonwealth, the man to whom we erect this monument lay manacled in a casement of a strongly garrisoned fortress, charged with the most atrocious crimes known to man, treason and murder. He had been the unanimously chosen leader of a true people, who, actuated by pure and lofty patriotism, after exhausting every effort to compromise, made an attempt to establish a new nation. And after a bitter struggle of four years, after nearly four million soldiers had met in the shock of battle and over 2,000 battlefields had blazed with glorious deeds, went down in darkness and blood. Success is the measure of merit applied alike to every man, to every cause. And even in our moral judgments, we sentence the unfortunate. Men do not idly erect monuments to lost causes. Now, I want to... F- <laughs> Men do not idly erect monuments to lost causes. Fame has no trumpet for failure. So he's saying we don't idly put these things up to lost causes. Now, lost cause is often used as a pejorative. You hear it all the time. This is just lost cause propaganda. But what Lee is saying here is the cause that is lost is the spirit of independence. And he says later on, well, I'll read it, well, we should bury some of that stuff. The war settled some things. Secession is impracticable, as he says. And we've, we've had amendments to the Constitution that take care of some of the issues. But that doesn't mean that people that fought for liberty and how they conceived it should be ignored or called traitors. You don't idly put these things up. The world hears not the voice of the vanquished, yet history must teach us strange things of men who fail in causes that are lost. Genius did not keep Hannibal or Napoleon from defeat. Heroism went with Joan of Arc to the stake and Emmett to the scaffold. The eloquence of Demosthenes did not save Greece or Cato's virtue, Rome. Sometimes defeat gives a tragic pathos which lifts the commonplace into the, into the immortal and tenderly preserves the memory of the vanquished long after the victor has been forgotten. That is a true statement. Look, we go back through time and we think, well, these people... You know, they, they lost, but we still celebrate, or not, maybe not even celebrate, but we still talk about Hamil- Hannibal, right? We still talk about Cicero. Now, erecting monuments to these people was something that would happen or not happen. Uh, you know, the Arc de Triomphe is Napoleon's monument, essentially, in Paris, and it hasn't been torn down, even though they've rejected Napoleonic ambition and Napoleonic expansion. But it's still there. It's recognized as a great monument to France. Just as in the South, which had their own government for four years, recognized Davis and Lee and others as great monuments to that government. They were defeated, but they still erected these monuments in remembrance, as Lee will point out. Since the death of Napoleon, there has been no career which illustrates so dramatically the vicissitudes of fortune as that of Jefferson Davis. 
Born amid the rugged surroundings of a frontier state, he lived to win the triple glory of the soldier, the orator, and the statesman. He became the ruler of seven million of people. He, his government was overwhelmed, his fortune swept away. He was bound as a criminal and prosecuted for his life. He became an exile. He was denied the rights of citizenship. He was defamed, denounced, insulted, ridiculed to the hour of his death. And yet he died by millions more sincerely mourned and deeply beloved than any other man in the history of the nation. If his enemies had succeeded in putting him to death, he would have been the most conspicuous figure in American history. I don't think there's any question about that, right? I mean, if Davis had been executed for treason, the most conspicuous figure. Now, maybe that's a little lofty, right? Washington would probably still be more conspicuous, and there are others that we might have put here. But Davis would have been up there. We actually produced a great video at the Abbeville Institute. You can go out and look for it uh, by Bertram Hayes Davis, who is a descendant of Jefferson Davis, and uh, did a great little it's about a 10 minute video on Jefferson Davis and why he's so important and why we should honor Jefferson Davis. Many of these people, and actually I say all of these people who had become prominent in the Confederacy had been staunchly dedicated to the United States. They've been active participants in the United States military, other things. They were great Americans who had a different path, sought a different path. And of course, through that principle of independence, secession, uh, political independence, they had become traitors. And that word traitor is thrown around, and as Lee points out, it's, it means nothing really. He says, When the mists of passion and prejudice have passed away, the calm light of justice gives the right niche to each figure in history. The descendants of men who... Burn Joan of Arc, now regard her as a character of heroism and beauty. The posterity of the men who hanged witches in Salem as a pious duty now hear the story with horror. The descendants of the men who today look on Jefferson Davis with unkind expressions will see him as we do. The stainless gentleman, the gallant soldier, the devoted patriot, the pure and gifted statesman. Now that, when you read that now, this is said in 1896, a little over 100 years ago, 125 years ago. When you read that now, think about what's happened. None of that has happened. Davis is probably more vilified today than he was in 1896. We know that after his monument was torn down in Richmond, it was put in the Valentine Museum in a state of disrepair. It wasn't fixed. It was still stained with paint. It still had toilet paper on it. And it was laying prostrated. So the people that put that there did it on purpose. And that way... They didn't look at him as a gallant soldier or devoted patriot or pure gifted statesman. No, they looked at him as a traitor. So I think today, because of the fact that uh, the telling of the war and Reconstruction has gotten to a point where the South is still seen as the enemy of everything, I mean, that's still what, we, what the general consensus is on Jefferson Davis. So what Stephen D. Lee is hoping to accomplish here with this did not work. He says, I do not propose to discuss now the unhappy causes leading to the war between the states. It is still too soon, 1896, 30 years. Criminating and recriminating over irritating causes of differences cannot readjust what the war had settled. We must wait for the mists of, to clear away, and that will take another generation. It does no good to recall our wrongs, real or fancied. It keeps up partisan feeling. It gives an excuse for ill will. Now think about what you said. If we talk about these wrongs all the time, what does that create? Ill will. This is a statement of reconciliation. It gives, it's no point to do this. Now, for the one side, the left in this, in American society now, they would think that it does have a purpose. The ill will is the point because it eradicates all of this stuff. That's the point. If you don't have ill will, well, then these things, these monuments can go up and people can be treated with respect and they, we don't like these people, so they must be done away with. It's important to note what he's saying here, right? So the monument and you know, reconciliation, the, the real attack today is not on the monuments itself. 
It's not on symbols and monuments or even the principles of secession or decentralization or the things that the Institute likes to discuss. The real effort is to say that Southerners were bad people and they didn't deserve reconciliation. Reconciliation was the problem. That's what the effort is now. Others ably treated the Southern view of the controversy. Their argument is submitted to impartial history. Suffice it to say on this occasion that the war has settled that secession is impracticable and the amendments of the Constitution have adjusted all other differences. The Southern people have fully accepted the results. They accept the present and loyally commit themselves to the future. Now again, think about what you just said there. We ex Southerners accept this stuff. We accept what happened. We've given the story of the war. History can tell you, and partial history can tell you if that's right or wrong. He's not saying that we're not going to talk about these things. Not just not now, 31 years later. It's still too, too soon. We're still remembering with these monuments. This is st the wounds are still fresh. And that's why they have memorials, and that's why they put up something to Robert E. Lee or Jefferson Davis, because these were people that still remembered them, and they were defeated, and they needed remembrance. They didn't do all this for nothing. He says, Neither shall I attempt to recount his life, for it is part of history. The record is made up. If we protect it from falsification while we live, the verdict of history will not shame our posterity when we are dead. Today we meet, and the past and present join hands. Looking around me, viewing the faces of the fair women and brave men before me, I realize that the past is behind me, that this is the living present. Now, let me back up. If we protect it from falsification while we live, the verdict of history will not shame our posterity when we are dead. So if we protect the history of the South from falsification now, the verdict of history will not shame our posterity, our descendants when we are dead. Now again, people look at this and say, well, this is why they're making all this stuff up, because they know that if they don't say these things, right, I mean, this is, this is what's going to happen. They're making all this up because they want to protect their children from being called all kinds of bad names. But is that not what's happening now anyways? Uh, and, and this is this is an amazing you know discussion of what's happening in 1896. You can see some of the things that you know 2021, 2022, 2023. Heck, go back to 2015. Go back to 2000. You start seeing some of these things. I feel the influence of the new hopes of the new generation to which you belong. Our task is to commit into your hands what our failing hands cannot much longer hold, the sacred rights for which your fathers sacrificed their lives, their property, everything. These liberties and the land which was so dear to them we commit to you. I will only say you cannot excel your fathers. Revere them, emulate them. May you be worthy of them. Uh, this is a charge that Lee often made, uh, S.D. Lee made to the Confederate veterans, sons of Confederate veterans, ultimately. I mean, that you had to emulate you know, your, your fathers and uh, be dedicated to the cause for which they fought. Now, of course, some would say, well, that was slavery. But uh, we know that the vast majority of Southerners were not fighting for the institution of slavery. They were fighting for independence. They said it. They said it. He says, it is hard to believe that the American people will always desire to have the epithets of traitor and rebel applied to names which are now, and unless human nature changes, always will be dear and honored in the hearts of a large part of their number, honored by men who made a duty, a passion, a religion, dear to the posterity of those who were the foremost in sacrifices in the establishment of the republic and the increasing of its area and the vindication of principles of government inherited from their forefathers and accepted as correct for the first 50 years of the Republic. It's hard to believe, he says, that these people will be vilified. You read that now in a way that makes you really stop and, and think about that. It's hard to believe in 1896 that anyone who thought that Southerners should at least be respected or admired 
would be now vilified, but they are. Hard to believe. But of course it happened. He says, the future historian will note with astonishment that the Southern struggle for independence began not with committees of public safety, or with declarations of the rights of men, or enunciation of the mighty doctrine that governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed, but it began with public statutes, general elections, and constitutional conventions. Mr. Davis himself rested in his inaugural in the case of the new nation at the bar of the public opinion of the world, not upon revolution, but upon legal right. It's a very important thing to note. Right? This wasn't a revolution to these people. This was a legal right to do this. And again, getting into why this is essential. You know, We have this memorial to Davis. What does it actually mean? And Lee is going to talk about that. This is what it means. Davis represents this position that what happened in 61 wasn't, just, wasn't a revolution. It wasn't an insurrection. It wasn't a rebellion. It was a legal right. It was a legal right. He said, The rights soundly proclaimed in the birth of the states, which have been affirmed and reaffirmed in the bills of rights of states subsequently admitted to the Union of 1789, invariably recognize in the people the power to resume the authority delegated for the purposes of government. Thus, the sovereign states here represented proceeded to form this confederacy, and it is by abuse of language that their act has been de denominated a revolution. You might also have said the very Constitution of the United States was adopted by acts of secession, violating the Articles of Confederation. That's true, too, if you want to take that position. You can argue that, certainly. So we have Jefferson Davis, this monument to Jefferson Davis. What Lee is getting at here is what this does is it represents this position of a constitutional right. Now he's saying secession is impracticable. He said, we've settled that. We've settled the issue. It's impracticable. It can't happen. The amendments of the Constitution have settled the old squabbles. That, that's over. But he still thinks that Davis represents the best of this Southern view of government, which he said was the operating norm for 50 years. The South learned its constitutional law from Jefferson, Madison, and Calhoun, not from Hamilton and Marshall. They considered secession as a constitutional remedy in 1861. They believed a separate confederacy with their constitutional rights retained better than a union with these rights trampled upon and ignored or held together by physical force. The junior senator from Massachusetts has written these words. When the Constitution was adopted by the votes of the states of Philadelphia and accepted by the votes of the states in popular conventions, it is fair to say that there was not a man in the country from Washington and Hamilton on the one side to George Clinton and George Mason on the other who regarded the new system as anything but an experiment entered upon by the states and from which in which each and every state had the right to peaceably withdraw, a right which was very likely to be exercised. True, right? So he's saying this is, this is what people thought. This is not a strange assertion. The southern states only exercise a right which had been threatened by New England and which was generally conceded to be a constitutional right. But in 1861, the Union had grown with the growth of the American people and strengthened with strength until, like a young oak, it had burst the old constitutional rocks asunder on sectional lines and issues. The South was fighting against the, the stars and their courses. But standing on this sacred spot, I should be false in the memory of the dead if I did not remind you that he, the man we all adore, battled for the constitutional right to dissolve the Union, not for revolution, not for slavery, that the war was fought upon a legal, not a moral issue, and it's, it is significant that slavery is not mentioned either in the Confederate inaugural or in Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Now, again, this is where people will say, well, see, the lost cause is trying to minimize slavery. Well, I don't think Lee would ever say that, whatever. I mean, he said it be, to begin with. You know, we, we had these issues all settled. Of course, slavery was an issue. It was settled by the 13th Amendment. It was a major issue. To say it wasn't is false. In the American political system, it was a major issue in the antebellum period. 
Why was it a major issue is always the question. It was a major issue because of the extension. Because there was a debate over how slavery should be viewed in the Western territories. Not in the states where it already existed, but in the Western territories. That was always the question. Jefferson and others, Jefferson Davis included, believed in diffusion. That if you, if you spread slaves out over a larger territory, eventually it will, it will go away. You take it out of some areas where it just kind of minimizes and you put it in other areas and eventually it just goes away. Now, you can say that was a faulty position or not. We can argue that, whether that would have worked well. But the real issue, as Lee points out, was power. Right? The North was going to coerce the South to stay in the Union. That was the real issue. Now, Lincoln, I will say this, Lincoln does not directly mention slavery, but he does implicitly mention slavery in the Gettysburg Address. Um, people knew what he was talking about there. It is a pleasant reflection today that the feelings which human nature cannot repress in this sad hour of defeat have found the gentle and secure medicine of time. A new generation has risen underneath the healing wings of peace that are strangers to the discord of their fathers and the gray-haired veterans of Gettysburg and Chickamauga, conscious of their rectitude of purpose and lofty patriotism, now yield loyal allegiance to the government, not having disavowed their manhood or with civility confessed that they were wrong, they have preserved their self-respect and won the respect of the nation. So they're now loyal to the government, but they never said they were wrong. So that, that maintained their self-respect and their manhood. For what then shall this monument stand? Jefferson Davis was truly, through his life, representative of his people. And the monument represents the love of the southern people for him. So this is what the monument was about. The love of the southern people for Jefferson Davis. It represents, Jefferson Davis has represented the people, and the love of the people for Jefferson Davis. And you could say that about just about every monument that has ever put up in the South with the Confederacy. It doesn't matter if it's for the common soldier, for Robert E. Lee, for Stonewall Jackson, for Jefferson Davis. It doesn't matter. These monuments were put up because people admired and respected those individuals. They loved them. They loved the common soldier. These, There were tangible... People forget how many Southerners died in that war, how many families were torn asunder. Also in the North, by the way, I mean, monuments in the North too, but how that remembrance worked. This was a physically and emotionally draining period of time, also economically for the South. But this was hard. We forget that as we just almost dehumanize these people and say they were just this. These are human beings facing emotional trauma. Uh, and look, I mean, this was emotionally traumatic for a lot of people black and white, in this period of time. There's no question about that. So how we do this, how we remember these things is important. Such a sentiment honors them even more than it honors him. It demonstrates the faithfulness of the Southern people to their leader, for better or for worse. Rather than suspected is that the, is that people to be honored and trusted whose attachments defy the vicissitudes of time and fortune and reach in loving fortitude beyond the grave. So uh, this is just a really interesting speech. And again, I wanted to pull out a couple of the parts at the beginning. Uh, and I want to get to the end of the speech because he says some really interesting things. He said... Uh, Around him stood the marvelous, that marvelous group, Lee, the follower of chivalry, Jackson, the genius of war, Toombs, the thunder of debate, Benjamin, the jurist, Campbell, the judge, Bledsoe, the scholar, Hunter, the statesman, men fit to measure with the, with the knightliest, yet from the vantage of ground of history, his sublime head lifts itself above them all. It is met and fitting that the ashes of the great souls rest in Virginia's soil. Round him sleep the mighty ones who, ga who have gone before, Soldiers who won American history. Jurists who gave it perpetual form. Statesmen who filled its flag with stars and made it honorable throughout the world. Let Richmond be added to Mount Vernon, Monticello, and Lexington. The South has committed the keeping of the ashes to the mother of states and statesmen. 
That's Virginia, right? They're keeping the ashes to Virginia. Let him sleep in Virginia, where every river whispers of Confederate heroism and every hill was crimson with the soldier's blood. Let him rest in Richmond, his capital, the city which he wailed about with the breasts of the bravest of the brave. I'm sorry, walled about, excuse me. His memory is safe with you. You are were faithful to the living. You will not forget the dead. In calmer years, when the last ember of sectional feeling has burned out. Now think, Lee saw a time when the sectional animosity would, would fade away. It would be gone. In calmer years, when we're not thinking about sectional animosity anymore, when everyone's just north or south, and it doesn't matter. Nobody's saying that Lee was a bad guy or Davis was a bad guy. No one's criticizing northern heroes. None of that. It's not happening. In calmer years when this is gone, and the last cord of love has has gently bound the hearts of all Americans together, fathers will bring their little children to this spot and tell the story of a pure great man who suffered for his people and, and for the right as they understood it. Can you do that anymore? When all the sexual animosity is gone, fathers will bring their children there to talk about the great man. You can't do that anymore. It's gone. And how for this they loved him as they loved no other. Long as yonder noble river shall roll its tide to the sea, and it shall, it shall behold no man more kingly. He was a very perfect, gentle knight. May the story of his life be sweet in days to come, and at last all men come to understand Jefferson Davis. So, I mean, this is just an interesting speech. It gives you a glimpse into what people were thinking as they erected these monuments. You hear all the time, well, these people were just interested in perpetuating, you know, defiance or racism, whatever it is. Um, but here we have S.D. Lee saying, this is to, to show throughout the South and throughout the United States that people love Jefferson Davis. Uh, and maybe in future generations, people will do the same thing. We know what happened. We know the end of the story now. The end of the story has been told a hundred years later. It makes an interesting story. And I think someday historians will write that story compiled together. We've got people writing books now talking about the lost cause myth and uh, you know how the monuments were one were intended to be uh, you know e these uh, evil reminders of a terrible past and all this kind of stuff. But maybe one day people will put that speech together with the vitriol of those assessments and ask the question, was Lee just foolish or misguided or not forward-thinking enough to understand what would really happen? Until next time, good day.